When we left off, you were a nobody who was slaughtered before you could make it out of the clinic you traveled so far to visit. You died, another corpse and nothing more. And then you woke up in a dream. You probably have questions. What is the hunter's dream? Am I dead? Why did someone leave a doll outside? That can't be good for it. You'd think if someone bothered to make a creepy, life-size porcelain doll, they'd at least take care of it. And your questions are valid, but Bloodborne leaves you to wander a dream much denser than it seems. Inspecting the doll gets you nowhere, so you focus on the grey guys nearby, and they're identified as messengers and offer you one of three weapons. They're trick weapons, a title somehow both fanciful and sinister, and are sourced to the workshop. The fact their gimmick is described as a trick says a lot more about whoever runs the workshop than the trick itself. Our first weapon, the saw cleaver, describes hunting as a business. We still don't know exactly what we're hunting, but this weapon insists it's beasts. We can assume its trick is that it transforms. The saw cleaver has become a symbol for the hunt, supposedly for its beast-like teeth, but it's also the weapon used in promotional material for the game. Its rapid attacks encourage a rabid approach to combat. The Hunter Axe is punny. It offers a wider palette of attacks by transforming, because it extends the handle to make a pole axe. Its charged power attack has been dubbed by players Spin to Win, and for good reason. It symbolizes a cold executioner in The Hunt, no business here, and it's great for Rally, another fanciful and sinister mechanic to be discussed later. Its moves are heavier, stronger, more decisive than the Saw Cleaver. It makes you feel like a slasher movie villain. The last option is the Threaded Cane. Its hunt is simply duties. The cane extends into a serrated whip, and its use is considered an act of ceremony to separate the hunter from its prey. It's the most technical of the three weapons, with conductor-like cane strikes and slow but ranged whips. You feel like you're brandishing a bad dog, or keeping it at bay. But the saw cleaver isn't just the default and promotional weapon, it's probably the most honest and least steeped in pretensions like executing or ceremonial roles. We'll take it. Next, we get a gun. The hunter blunderbuss for the hunter's line of work, or the hunter pistol for stalking beasts. Clearly there are different perspectives on this hunt. These guns use quicksilver mixed with your blood. What is quicksilver and why is your blood good against beasts? If we assume quicksilver is the same thing in Bloodborne as the real world, we can read far more into Bloodborne than even longtime fans may think. Quicksilver is an old name for the liquid element Mercury, the latter name deriving from the fastest orbiting planet and the Roman name for the Greek messenger god Hermes, fitting for a bullet, and the item art looks like the element. But Quicksilver has a more complicated role in alchemy. To vastly oversimplify, the idea of Mercury encompasses spirit, the moon, and womanhood. Mercurial is often used to describe women as unpredictable. The actual metal mercury was called our mercury, the physical manifestation of the idea. In alchemy, mercury is paired with sulfur, which represents the soul, sun, and manhood. Sulfur is life force and mercury is the mind. They coagulate to create salt, which represents the body in alchemy, but it's toxic in large quantities. Note the bloody fingerprints in the art. This implies how our own blood affects damage, but also relates the combination back to the bodily. This isn't the last time blood is linked to potency, and even flame, but also note that mercury is toxic and drives one insane. Womanhood, understanding, insanity, and change are all tied together by Quicksilver, and so linked to blood, as discussed in the first video. There's a reason for nearly everything in this game, and there's a reason the bullets are Quicksilver and not actual silver, the traditional metal of werewolf slaying narratives. Back to the guns. The pistol fires and holsters much quicker, has greater range, and does significantly more damage. But, the blunderbuss has such a wide spread at close range that it's all but guaranteed to hit even fast targets, and sometimes multiple targets. Most importantly though, the blunderbuss is the promotional gun. We'll take it. The last messenger's gift is a notebook, which explains to us that the messengers revere the brave hunters. You can use pre-selected phrases to leave notes that appear in other people's games for the sake of interplane intelligence. Sounds like an excuse for asynchronous online play, but the messengers are charming. We'll take it. What the game doesn't say is that while foul ratings will make the note disappear for everyone, if someone rates your note fine while you are playing, you're fully healed. We stand on each other's shoulders to survive. Speaking of which, one of the few things you can explore right now is a curving slanted path behind you perfect for practicing the game's controls, which are given by developer notes, the ones you can't rate, that line set path. 
in universe this is extremely effective even abandoned and alone someone left behind guidance and yet again you're picking up the pieces and standing on shoulders but these notes don't cover all the controls nor properly explain the game's more complicated mechanics and that's the main conflict of bloodborne's opening hour or so in a nutshell your narrative solitude is ingrained in the gameplay and it artfully makes you feel lost and afraid but it's so obtuse and difficult for newcomers that I can't begrudge those who walked away. You can wander through the dream a bit more and discover some baths and stumps. Most are empty, but one has a shop run by messengers, and they trade in blood echoes, which you started the game with but lost all of when you died. But until you get more, we can peruse their wares. Blood vials are how you heal, and an animation that implies you're injecting them into your leg with a sound like a breath of fresh air. Ministration is unique but common in Yarnum, and blood is described in terms of addiction. Something is very wrong here. Molotov cocktails reinforce beasts fear of fire, but also reference the tragedy of old Yarnum, which apparently equated fire to cleansing impurity. An odd word, impurity, implies contamination. Meanwhile, pebbles have the best item description in the entire game. What it doesn't describe is their primary use, to lure single enemies away from groups with the pettiest opening volley imaginable. Lastly, we find the Yarnum Hunter set, and it brings up a lot pretty quickly. There is a proper noun healing church, and it is what deployed the hunters. Someone named Ludwig was the first, and drafted civilians, giving them this set, which helped, but not enough to stand any real chance against the beasts. Did Ludwig or the church know that the hunt was a suicide mission? If the hunters aren't random conscripts now, who are they? And do they all have this dream? In your own inventory, you can also find the hunter's mark, and this is the strangest item of all. Meditating on it allows you to sacrifice your blood echoes to awaken afresh, which really means return to your last checkpoint in the game. It's also implied to activate upon death the last thing you see before you die. Besides resembling the brand of sacrifice from Berserk, it looks like a claw grabbing something, but is described as dangling upside down. It's unclear why hunters are symbolized by something inverted, or how the rune is etched in one's mind. Of even more mysterious note to those who know the game well, there appear to be two somethings leading into the top of the dangling rune. You have this item when you wake up in Yosekla's clinic. Did you get it from the blood transfusion? The messengers? Or was it already there? Was it always there? Let's say to clear your head, you wander over to a gate. You can see a beautiful white flower field beyond, but the gate is locked. This is not for you. You will return to something much uglier. You do so by interacting with an awakening headstone, which can currently send you back to the first floor sick room. Note for now two things. You are waking up, and you are doing so above ground. So, where are you now? You dissipate in the same way as when you died, but don't think too much about this all, you won't get far. Quick note about the loading screens. When the game launched, these screens took twice as long, and only had the word Bloodborne on them. With a patch to alleviate load times came random item descriptions on load screens. Because they're totally random, I can't really account for them in a reading of this game. Personally, I think they should have done something with the hunter's mark. You return to this world armed. There's nowhere to go but back to the beast, so you return. Things go differently. Woof. Outside are more gates, but you can only go through one path. A small area contains items on the ground and some beast men. You may have reservations, they look kind of human. But they attack first and their deaths are unceremonious, and you encounter your first surprise attack. Also worth noting, in Japan where this game was made, desecrating a corpse is especially heinous, and you knock your dead around like ragdolls. Mechanization is established with a lever-activated ladder. As you ascend, you can see some gorgeous architecture in the distance. that. At the ladder's top, you find another messenger's light post that acts as a checkpoint should you die, and a means to return to the hunter's dream. You also find a lit window, and upon investigation, this. Oh, you must be a hunter. And not one from around here either. I'm Gilbert. 
A fellow outsider. You must have had a fine time of it. Yarnum has a special way of treating guests. Well, I don't think I could stand if I wanted to, but I'm willing to help if there's anything that can be done. <laughs> this town is cursed. Whatever your reasons might be, you should plan a swift exit. Whatever can be gained from this place, it will do more harm than good. <laughs> Pale blood, you say? Hmm. Never heard of it. But if it's blood you're interested in, you should try the healing church. The church controls all knowledge on blood ministration and all varieties of blood. Across the valley to the east of Yarnum lies the town of the healing church, known as the Cathedral Ward. And deep within Cathedral Ward is the old Grand Cathedral. The birthplace of the healing church's special blood, or so they say. <laughs> Yarnamites don't share much with outsiders. Normally they wouldn't let you near the place, but the hunt is on tonight. This might be your chance. This is our third Pale Blood mention of five. Get out your bingo sheets! And as forewarned in episode one, we learn nothing from this mention. Tone is set, but the possibility of friendlies is also established, and we're given a real direction towards a cathedral that apparently bore all this special blood. The only way forward now is a dangerous lane crawling with enemies. We'll cover it more in depth next episode, but right now we've reached the culmination of everything Bloodborne has done so far how the game's combat mechanics will finish conditioning you as hostile against this world. The first mechanic is the trick weapon's transformations, and both the weapon's forms have uses. Most importantly to us right now, though, is that there are transform attacks which switch a weapon's form within a combo, and timing this one attack right decides whether or not you have to back down or not. See, your melee attacks have slight knockback on enemies, which pushes them out of melee range. But transforming your weapon often extends your weapon's reach enough to keep attacking or allow for chase downs. Not only that, but if you get surrounded while focusing on one foe, the increased range enables sweeping attacks to keep them at bay. Second, Rally describes the fact that some of the damage you take can be recovered by striking an enemy within a brief window after you were hurt. And you can continue to rally off an enemy's corpse if you kill them in this window. It's implied that their blood is what's healing you a gruesome reality for such a lighthearted name. Third, the guns are described as counters because they're primarily used not for damage, but to repost, which is quite a regal name for the fact that a gunshot will cancel a lot of enemy attack animations, and when timed perfectly, it can fully stun the enemy. You'll get an audio cue for this. You can also stun most enemies by sneaking up behind them and getting off a fully charged power attack, and some bosses by relentlessly striking them. This stun leads to our fourth and final mechanic, Visceral Attacks. After a stun, tapping the regular attack button at close range allows you to reach into the enemy and rip your hand through them in one of the most gruesome yet satisfying moves in video games. The audio, visual, and controller vibration cues here are an opus. You may not notice your right arm extend and become claw-like in the process, like some enemies have, and it's slow to return to normal size. Remember, Visceral describes both your guts and your gut instincts. People have endlessly described that these mechanics encourage proactive, aggressive play. Hell, H-Bomber Guide did an hour and a half video primarily on these mechanics, coining the term play conditioning to describe how a game's mechanics and setup encourage playing the game in a specific way. Bloodborne's way is aggression. But it's far, far more than that. It's instinct. It doesn't reward consideration so much as action and reaction, but that rewires how you think. Look at your combined mechanics. Your trick weapons are best utilized when you transport them at the exact right moment to continue a combo at range. And Rally both forgives getting hit and rewards continued violence with health, something that would normally use up a blood vial resource. These two mechanics alone encourage you to keep attacking. These combine with your fast, long distance, and invincible dodge, 
You have to take breaks to let your stamina recharge, but because many enemies can chase you down, dodging away is dangerous. Instead, if you dodge toward and through an enemy attack, you get behind them, buy time while they turn around, and stay close to keep attacking. Where the above enables wild long assaults, reposts and visceral attacks reward initiating, getting in the enemy's face and countering, stealthing and striking first, or not letting up on bosses. And Bloodborne tries to surprise you so you can't plan as much as possible. Caution plays off in new areas, but usually the most you can do to even the odds is strike first. Bloodborne rewards precise play more than cautious, offensive play over defensive. Bloodborne doesn't want you to think. It wants you to ingrain in your marrow when to attack and how to react. It wants you to be primal, animal, a beast. That's gameplay, but the narrative effect is that you're not thinking about what or who you're killing or why. You're taught almost immediately that this place is hostile to you and isn't afraid to strike first, so you don't even consider mercy, only potential threats. Better safe than sorry always has consequences, but right now, it's just how you survive. You are a hunter. You are hunting. And as you improve, your instinctual movements get so practiced that they become nearly mechanical. And that mercurial shift from instinctual aggression to mechanical precision makes you more terrifying and monstrous than your prey. And maybe you, player, should be worried about how much fun you're having when you're drenched in blood and thirsting for more.